Before we begin this episode, I just want to let you guys know of the first official Shadowversity meet and greet, where we can finally meet, hang out, and have a bit of fun. It's specifically on the 14th of July at the Abbey Medieval Festival in Caboolture, Queensland. I'm actually going to be there on both days of the festival, so that's the 13th and the 14th, though the official meet and greet is on the 14th. Now, like I said, it is in Australia, so apologies to all my international viewers. Love you heaps. Maybe we'll try and organise something internationally in the future, but this in and of itself is actually a big step to try and organise and set up. And some people have even mentioned that they're intending on flying over to make it to the event, which is just phenomenal. And if you can, it'll be even more fun if you can dress up in medieval clothing or armour or something like that. There are certain rules about swords, so check out the actual rules of the event on their webpage. At the meet and greet, I'll be filming a live Shadowversity episode, which will be uploaded to the channel. But there'll be cool, fun competitions like the best matriculations war cry, who can do the best sword flourish with a LARP sword, and the best drawer and sheathing of a sword from my back scabbard as well. Uh, prizes will be really cool, high quality LARP swords that are historically accurate, valued at $200 as well. So legitimate prizes, which are heaps of fun. There'll be a Q&A and also heaps of opportunities to take a picture with me if you see me around the event or at the meet and greet itself. And then on top of all of this, it is an awesome medieval festival as well. Tickets are available now, I'll put a link in the description. Hope to see you there if you can make it, it's gonna be awesome. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I want to address a myth, a misconception that's unfortunately still fairly prominent within our community and just general understanding about swords. Now, I have addressed this before, but it's a part three in my full series on the Falchion and Messer, so it kind of gets lost in that series. And only people who are really into this subject would generally want to watch a five-part series, and it's an older video, so a lot of my newer viewers I haven't even seen it. So it really requires its own dedicated video because, like I said, this myth is still getting around. And what is this? Well, it's in regards to a pretty cool sword. And the sword is known as the Messer. So the Messer is a German word that simply means knife, but it applies to the sword. And so when you're being particularly technical trying to identify this sword. The one-handed one you can identify as a Langsmesser and the two-handed one you can identify as the Kriegsmesser or Grossmesser. So why do these swords bear a name that effectively translates to knife? Well, it's specifically about the way their hilt is constructed because the hilt is constructed like a knife is generally constructed. So normal sword construction, thin tang that runs through the actual handle and then pummel connecting it, sandwiching it all together. Whereas with a knife, the tang is usually as wide as the handle and instead of going through the actual handle you have two halves this is actually speaking generally because there are other ways in which messer handles have been constructed that don't always have the sandwich method where you have half a handle and half a handle riveted on either side with kind of like a pummel cap at the end not like a full-fledged pummel but enough and then what is also very common on the messes is a nagel which is, just means nail it's a side kind of quillen really small which just pokes off the side of the sword. Lang's messes and Krieg's gross messes became quite popular in late medieval Germany, even though Germany as a country didn't really exist at that time, it was the Holy Roman Empire, and it was more a collection of fairly independent states, even though there was a more overarching authority that didn't have huge amounts of sway. But anyway, I won't go into the actual political details of this time period. Maybe you'd be interested in its own video. I want to focus on the sword right now. So the mystery is how did this sword come about? Why was it developed and become so distinctively its own thing separate to other types of sword with its very distinct handle construction and the myth. This is the incorrect idea that gets uh, promoted quite a lot and I think YouTube has actually done quite a bit of uh, harm, it's not really harm, but anyway, in perpetuating this myth. And it's the idea that swords were outlawed in late medieval Germany. And I know Germany's not really Germany, I'm just going to say that, okay, for our own understanding, layman's terms, okay? They say swords were outlawed and uh, they say to circumvent that law specifically, they would make the sword the way a knife is made because under some supposed charters in the law that a sword was defined by how they were made. And uh, that was the uh, strict definition and the lower class wasn't allowed then. But the lower class, to circumvent it, would have their swords made like a knife and then when pulled up, it's like, sorry governor, it's a knife, not a sword. And when you just think about it logically, that doesn't make sense because any person with heart, two brain cells would look at this and know, no, it's a sword, you idiot. A sword is more classically defined by length, not the way they're made, but 
why do they call it a knife? Why is this sword called a knife then? And so there's some weird thing going on, and a much better theory has arisen as to explain this. But first let me debunk this idea of circumventing the not being allowed to carry a sword thing. And it comes to the fact that in late medieval Germany, it was actually the opposite. In most instances, not in every instance, but in most instances, far from it being illegal for the common citizen to own and carry a sword, it was a legal requirement for them to do so. The exact opposite. And yes, I have a direct reference for this as well. It is the book called The Martial Ethic of Early Modern Germany. I, I hope I'm getting that right. All right, I got one word wrong. It was the martial ethic in early modern Germany, civic duty and the right to bear arms. It's actually a really well-researched book. It's great, okay? And when you say early modern Germany, he's looking at specifically the 1400s to the 1700s, okay? And the 1400s, that is direct bang right where the late medieval period is for us. So he released several sources from this period explaining where it was a legal requirement to carry a sword. He does mention two cities where it was illegal to carry a sword and that those laws don't seem to be actively enforced, okay? Now, as to the broader context of the legality of carrying swords throughout the medieval period, I'm gonna be making a whole dedicated video on that subject, not just focusing on Germany itself because it's an interesting thing and what is the real answer here for the common person versus the lord the higher ups and things the officials and so for the broader discussion wait for that video if it's already out i'll link it in the card description and stuff but from the time that this video is published you're just gonna have to wait a couple of days now i have read word for word what is actually in the book describing this but to save time i will link it in the description below and suffice it to say it was a legal requirement to own and carry a sword in late medieval Germany, that very place where the messer was prominent. And so the idea that commoners weren't allowed to carry swords, so they made them like knights to go around the law, is, a, is completely incorrect. It's a contradiction on what actually was happening. And, and again, it's worth reading because the book is great and goes into interesting details about the culture around bearing arms in this period. And that it was actually a, like a penalty if you uh, were, uh, you know, guilty of lawlessness for some reason, like wife beating or any number of reasons, you, uh, the sword would be taken, you would lose the right and privilege to carry a sword, okay? But it was a general privilege are allotted to every male and males and look it changes because between cities there was always slight differences and stuff but only two cities specifically outlawed it completely so then why is this sword called a knife and why was it developed the way it was well the best theory that i actually think is closest to being accurate was shared to me by what who is basically the foremost authority on single-edged medieval swords even a bit later in the medieval period and stuff james elmsley okay he literally or is literally writing the book on the subject and he's developed a thing called the Elmsley typology. I announced that in my four, three, four part video series and even did a graphic, you know, the Elmsley typology and stuff as a free resource to everyone. So again, there's far more complexity and sophistication around the notion of the commoner being allowed or disallowed to carry swords. And uh, the, uh, the actual restrictive method that was generally put in place was not ever on how it was constructed, but in the length of the blade, okay? And so if you go to what, like only these two cities, if you go to one of these two cities in Germany itself where sword carrying was restricted, it wasn't completely outlawed. Uh, again, I'll, I'll talk about this more in my dedicated video. And in, in a lot of instances, you were allowed to carry a sword, but when you weren't, it was by length, okay? Length of blade. So if you pulled out, no, no, it's really a knife, it's like, I don't care if you've made it however you want, it's that it passes the, you know, restricted length of weapons or whatever, so you're not allowed to carry it, and they wouldn't be now to carry it. So again, why were these swords made like knives and called knives? James Elmsley, his idea, which I, again I think is really, really interesting, is the idea around guilds, okay? So guilds, you could kind of look at them as the, a very early type of unionization, okay, between different craftsmen and stuff. But this wasn't really to get better wages from whoever your employer was and stuff like that. It was almost like developing small monopolies and stuff, but also a stamp of authority, all right? If you could be a member of the guild, that meant your craft, whatever it was, if you were part of the carpentry guild and everything, and it's hard to define exactly how many guilds 
guilds there were, but I have like found coat of arms in, you know, town halls of all these guilds and everything like that, and it seems to be almost one for every single dedicated craft. And what does seem quite evident is that there was a specific knife makers guild and sword makers guild, okay? Now what's interesting, if you're a specific member of it, one of these guilds, that meant you had the stamp of authority, the guild approved your work, so people knew where, if you went to this, you know, person who was a member of the guild, your products were of the right quality standard. They would have to pay a certain amount for the guilds as well, but there was a lot of give and take because by doing this, uh, if you ever went became sick, okay, and you're a member of the guild, the guild would help take care of you because you couldn't work and earn a wage or anything, or well, not a wage, because if you're a craftsman, you would be earning your own money based on the things you are producing and selling yourself. But anyway, if you became sick, the guild would actually help take care of you and provide for you financially until you got better. So there was a lot of, you know, give and take in regards to the guild. You have to pay some back, but they took care of you, stamp of quality, and all those things. And they also interestingly regulated the amount of craftsmen who practice a certain craft within a city to make sure demand and quality was always at the right level, which is a bit shady, a bit of, you know, trying to artificially create a monopoly on a certain market, but hey, people are people and if they can find ways of uh, making greater profit and helping themselves out and they don't think it's too dishonest, it's kind of dishonest, but anyway, I'll say guilds, right? But what's interesting is when you have two guilds that are very similar to one another because, all right, the difference between a knife and sword, what is the difference between a knife and sword, okay? Uh, is, is it length? Well, it seems like one of the ways in which they defined the difference between a knife and sword was actually the way the hilt was constructed and somewhere someone might have missed a specific length requirement because what is a really big knife, okay? If you have, a, you know, something that's this big, is that, is that a short sword or is it a knife? The crossover is really, really grey. And so if someone was to specifically nail down, no, you cannot make a knife this big, well, what if you make it like half a centimetre shorter? And you, like, what is the difference? Oh, but, and then when you keep doing that and you get too short, you're trying to restrict the knife makers and actually making legitimate knives. And same when, if you're, you know, you're not allowed to make it, you know, larger than this, all these things. And you say, swords aren't allowed to be so short, but okay, what if you went one centimetre over? It becomes so grey, it'd be really hard to find specific length. So it kind of makes sense that defining the length between a knife and a sword became quite grey. And with the restriction in carrying weapons, they didn't really care between knife and sword. They just said anything, knife or sword, over this length you weren't allowed. And so that restriction would apply if it was made like a knife or made like a sword regardless. But in regards to the actual actual definitions of what it is for the craftsman, very, very grey. And so it turns out that the craftsman seems to have started to try and poach some of the, uh, the customers from the sword makers by making really large knives with the hilt constructions of knives and according to their charters in their guilds and everything that was a knife it was not legally classified as a sword so they could still make them and if that is the case it makes sense that the knife makers guild just they're, they're slowly just seeing how far can they push the envelope making really really big knives and when people start to make an objection they have less grounds to really say it's a sword because how you know small can a sword get and how big can a knife get and so at one point it seems like the sword makers guilds kind of uh, had the idea or impression that this is speculation but it seems to be fairly valid that if you can't beat them join them okay you're making swords we can't get a rag for you but we know how to make really good sword blades so what if we make these blades sell them to you and you can help them finish them in whatever way you want and so james elmsley has shared with me some messer blades right that he because he has studied them in the museum and stuff like that that actually have manufacturing marks or you know identification things that i was able to find that the blade was actually made in Italy, okay, by one of the more famous and prominent sword maker groups in Italy. And then they were shipped to Germany and these knife makers got them and then hilted them themselves as messes. And so this is an instance where the sword makers who are making the blades are selling them to the knife makers. Perhaps this might be a reason why the sword makers didn't kick up such a fuss about it. If you're making swords, we'll just sell you sword blades as well because now they have a way to sell in a market that they couldn't before. They can sell things to the knife makers guilds, even though the knife makers guilds are selling swords or anything, but if you can't beat them, join them so quite interesting best theory that I've found so far and it also makes sense why you would call a sword a knife because to a knife maker it has to be a knife but it's just a really really long knife uh, and even if at length regardless if you go into a specific city where you weren't allowed to carry them you wouldn't be able to carry them because it doesn't matter how it's made it's the length. So in summary, the idea that carrying swords were illegal for the common person in late medieval Germany, completely incorrect, okay? And it's not the reason why the Messer was developed or came about or became so prominent. Not at all. So let's get the idea out of the water. And of course, the reasons why we believe it was developed, best running theory. So I wanted to clear that up. Hope you enjoy, thank you for watching. And of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.